With all due respect. FNAF 2 sucks. Five Nights at Freddy's 2 sucks so much, it's literally the reason FNAF Plus exists. Seriously, were it not for some of FNAF 2's horrendous gameplay decisions, the highly anticipated remake of FNAF 1 might not even exist. There's been a lot of talk lately about Sister Location and how it's the worst Five Nights at Freddy's game. That's a fair assessment. It's a major departure from all of the others, and the actual night-to-night -night gameplay… It sucks. Yeah, definitely it sucks. It's awful. I'd rather play Security Breach. However, Sister Location's traditional FNAF gameplay, be it the secret ending or the custom night, holds up really well. It's fair and easy to understand, yet it still manages to be really challenging and fun. More importantly, it's also just one of the hypest moments in all of FNAF. Towards the end of the night, Ennard starts to call out to you in Elizabeth Afton's voice, and it's just so creepy. I'd argue it's one of the scariest moments in the series. For all its faults, Sister Location was a cool game that resurrected FNAF's story after the fourth entry's dream theory failed to pan out. It introduced what are now some of the series' most iconic characters like Baby and even William Afton. That's right, a lot of you might have forgotten, but the the first utterance of the name Afton, in the games at least, is in the intro to Sister Location. With all due respect, those aren't the design choices we were curious about, Mr. Afton. The Theft King channel is all about sad kittens and puppies. If you don't subscribe, you hate sad kittens and puppies. You don't hate sad kittens and puppies. Do you? It was the first FNAF game to really give us some characterization for the people involved in this horrific scenario. We get dialogue from William Afton, Michael Afton, Elizabeth Afton, and Baby. It's cool for a FNAF game to give us some glimpse into who we're playing as or who the victim that ended up inside this horrific animatronic was. Most FNAF games don't give us that. Up until now, the five nights in each FNAF game were all very similar. It was the same landscape each time, with new threats added and the difficulty turned up each night, but that was it. Unlike its predecessors, Sister Location has us going to different sections of the facility on different nights with unique dialogue and gameplay for each, and it really did make the game feel bigger and grander than any FNAF game before it. Things felt different from night to night, and I would argue that this multi-phase gameplay would eventually be perfected in FNAF 6. For all of its faults, Sister Location did a lot of things right, and in my opinion, the true black sheep of the FNAF series is FNAF 2. I know some of you might be shocked to hear this, FNAF 2 frequently tops community polls for the best FNAF game, and it's reached near legendary status in the community. This was the game that set everything into motion. It introduced cutscenes, the retro arcade minigames that randomly trigger on death, the purple guy, it established nearly all of the conventions that we've now come to associate with FNAF. It got rid of the nonsensical doors that require power to stay closed, and it nearly tripled the animatronic count over the first game. FNAF 1 had a handful of secrets to discover. The newspaper clippings, Golden Freddy, and later Scott would patch in an easter egg that crashed the game with the aforementioned bear's jump scare. However, FNAF 2 was full of secrets, and these ultimately led to the FNAF game theory coverage that we know today. When FNAF 1 came out, there was no Afton, there was no purple guy, there was just phone guy. MatPat's early game theory episodes tied the events of FNAF 1 to a real-life murder at a Chuck E. Cheese in Aurora, Colorado or something like that. Th there was no lore. FNAF 2 changed all of that. The game featured new, modern-looking animatronic designs alongside withered, dilapidated versions of the first game's cast. This of course led everyone to believe that the game would be a sequel, but perceptive players eventually realized that the game was actually a prequel, and I think this was really brilliant on series creator Scott Cawthon's part. You see, FNAF 1's story was ripe for expansion. Who were these kids that went missing and presumably ended up stuffed inside robots? Who did it? Why? By making FNAF 2 a prequel, Scott was able to start exploring these interesting questions that had emerged in the wake of the first game's success, and it led to what I can only describe as a golden age for FNAF and FNAF theories. However, setting aside the profound impact that FNAF 2 had on the series as a whole, I just… I hate the game. It's so bad. I love the animatronic designs, and I love the way they show up in your office and stare you down, but that damn music box is just so annoying. FNAF 2 introduces the puppet, or the marionette, a ghostly character that resides inside a gift box in the prize corner. We're warned early on that this animatronic can go anywhere, and that the only way to keep it at bay is to continually wind up a music box using some remote mechanism built into the security camera. If we ever let the music box stop, well, this happens. 
Five Nights at Freddy's 1 builds a lot of tension during the quieter moments when you're just scanning through the cameras trying to figure out what's going on. These days, many of us know the exact mechanics behind how the animatronics work, but back then we didn't and some of the most iconic FNAF reactions were predicated on this downtime that allowed the player to explore. It allowed us to scare ourselves and let tension build up so that when the jump scares finally did arrive, it was awesome. <laughs> Oh God, Unfortunately, FNAF 2 got rid of all of that. When a new animatronic is introduced, you can't devote your time to following it through the cameras and checking out all the cool renders of it moving through the pizzeria. Instead, you're forced to constantly go back to the prize counter camera and wind up the music box. On later nights, you basically can't use any other camera because you're so busy cycling between hiding behind the mask and winding up the music box. Again, you don't need to use all the cameras in FNAF 1 either, but you could, and most players did on their initial playthroughs. It isn't easy to pick up on exploits like cam stalling your first go around. Most players won't. In contrast, from the very first night in FNAF 2, the player is constantly worried about winding the stupid music box, and in my opinion, it really hurts the game's ability to control its tension. You actually do have a lot of time to explore the cameras on early nights. The game tries to be really forgiving and the timer takes forever to tick down, but it doesn't matter though. The player knows that the clock is running and they're always gonna have it at the forefront of their minds. Watch any FNAF 2 playthrough and you'll see that players wind up the music box obsessively. Most never let it elapse for more than a few seconds before topping it off again. The game even encourages this. The longer you wait before recharging the music box, the longer it takes to wind it back up. The result is a game that has a ton of cool characters, mechanics, renders, and scares, yet the player can't really enjoy them to their fullest because they're constantly preoccupied with the music box and the associated marionette. The music box wasn't a bad idea per se. Forcing the player to take their attention off of the more randomized threats was actually pretty clever. It was just the implementation that didn't work out so well. FNAF 3's gameplay emphasized the cameras perhaps more than any other game in the series, requiring that we search for Springtrap throughout Fazbear Frights and use sound lures and close vents as we desperately try to keep him away from us. Periodically, we'll encounter phantom animatronics and equipment malfunctions that force us to take our attention off of Springtrap, but these threats aren't constant. There's little that we can do to stop our cameras or audio lures from going out, and thus they aren't at the forefront of our minds during gameplay. We don't obsess over them. As a result, FNAF 3 is a much better game than FNAF 2 and it holds up particularly well even today. The game still manages to be fun on both blind and subsequent playthroughs. FNAF 4 didn't have any cameras, but Foxy operated similarly to how the music box did in FNAF 2. Whenever you get a chance, you run to the closet and hold it closed, reverting Foxy into earlier phases. That said, FNAF 4's gameplay is just so different, it's, it's hard to compare it directly. I'm not the only one who is especially unhappy with the music box's implementation in FNAF 2. FNAF Plus developer Fiznom disliked it so much, he made a full remake of FNAF 2 with the intention of fixing all of the things he despised about the game. They originally intended to release the game's source code, enabling anyone who was interested to tinker with it and potentially release their own FNAF mods, but this unfortunately drew the attention of Five Nights at Freddy's creator Scott Cawthon, who took the game down. During my interview with him this past June, I asked Fiznom why he thought his fan game in particular was taken down when so many other more egregious FNAF fan games, some of which are essentially just straight up pirated copies of Scott's official releases, remain up. One of the things he suggested to me was that Scott was perhaps made uncomfortable by his intention to make the game's code open source, which seems pretty likely to me. I get the impression that Scott is cool with people making their own FNAF games from the ground up, but he's less down with what would essentially become FNAF Maker software that anyone could use to effortlessly make a FNAF clone. Think about it, had FNAF 2 open source actually released, the FNAF fan game scene might look like Friday Night Funkin's does today, with every pop culture reference getting a hastily thrown together FNAF mod. That would suck, that would be terrible. After FNAF 2 open source was taken down and Fiznom reached out to Scott, they spoke, and at some point they discussed the classic FNAF games. Fiznom told Scott Cawthon that the music box in FNAF 2 was, quote, a horrible idea. That's literally why I didn't include it for FNAF 2 open source. As most are aware, Scott's takedown of this game is what ultimately led to FNAF Plus being conceptualized and included in the Fazbear fanverse. Think about that. The music box in FNAF 2 sucked so much that someone went and remade the whole game just so that they could omit it. Then that game got taken down, which led to its developer and Scott Cawthon getting into contact and ultimately led to what is undeniably the most widely anticipated FNAF fan game ever. We have the shitty music box to thank for FNAF Plus. The music box was so bad, it created FNAF Plus. 
Whoa. Sure, you could argue that this only refers to the music box, that the rest of FNAF 2 is fine, but I disagree. The music box is constantly in the background, taunting you, and it's impossible to ignore. Playing FNAF 2 open source where you can turn off the music box and enjoy the game in a manner more akin to FNAF 1, it's night and day. It's a strictly superior experience, and suddenly FNAF 2 goes from my least favorite game in the series to one of my favorites. I love FNAF 2 for what it represents, but the gameplay just doesn't hold up. In my opinion, it's aged much worse than any of the other entries, and while it was important in regards to setting up the characters and the scenario and all the good stuff that FNAF would eventually become known for, it didn't evolve the gameplay all that much. FNAF 3 and 4 were both radical departures from the prior games, and for all of Sister Location's faults, it did introduce new elements that are now critical to the series. Yes, the game is bad. Individually, none of the gameplay in Sister Location comes close to FNAF 2's most basic nights, music box included. However, when I go back and play Sister Location today, I still have fun. I still like try to play the whole game, even if I do skip a couple of the more frustrating mini games. When I try to play FNAF 2 though, I end up quitting by night 4 or 5. That music box is just so frustrating, it isn't fun. I think Sister Location is actually underrated by the community, whereas FNAF 2 is overrated. Both feel really similar to me in that they're almost transitory games, entries where Scott was playing around with ideas and not quite sure what direction he wanted to take the series, but I agree that Sister Location has the weakest gameplay in the series. Regardless, it had an immeasurable impact on the series as a whole. It was an ambitious game that placed Scott outside his comfort zone. It didn't continue to piggyback on the success of prior entries like 2 through 4 did. It, it it stumbled, but I still appreciate it for what it is. I still appreciate that Scott went out on a limb and tried something new. I think that's cool. FNAF 2, on the other hand, is often rated as the best game in the series by many fans, but I strongly disagree. Honestly, I suspect most of the people who say this haven't played FNAF 2 in a really long time. I think they're just remembering the hype around FNAF 2's release, and Markiplier's videos, and the MatPat theories, and the introduction of Purple Guy, and all that stuff, and, and that's fair. Those elements are just as important to FNAF as the gameplay, and to fans who don't play the games, which is a lot of people, those things are more important. However, from a pure gameplay perspective, I really just can't stand FNAF 2. I think it's super overrated, and yeah, I'd rather play Sister Location. While the minigames can get frustrating and annoying, it provides so much more variety, humor, and an overall more fun experience for me personally. What's your favorite FNAF game? For me, it's either FNAF 1 or FNAF 4, but I actually think I prefer Sister Location to 2. Yeah. 